Running is amazing, whether it's a 5K park run or an ultra marathon, I love it. But there's no doubt, it can sometimes be a bit repetitive. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. It can go left, left, right, right, but now you're skipping and people will laugh. No, what makes running better is occasionally breaking it up with something else. And in many ways, that is exactly what the human body was designed for. Run, hunt for food, run, fight off a tiger. So it's no surprise that with the invention of shops and the reduction of tiger numbers, obstacle course racing, and then more lately, high rocks, has gotten so popular. As a way to use as many of our physical abilities as possible in one event, it's hard to think of anything better. And it's certainly a world away from the current trend for thinking that fitness starts and ends with gym bros doing lateral raises in a squat rack before taking a shirt to selfie in the gym toilets. But which is best? Obstacle course racing, OCR, or high rocks? If you've done neither, which should you try first? If you've only done one of them, is it worth having a go at the other? I'm gonna answer all those questions and more in a style so entertaining that even if you are a full-on gym bro, you'll find something to like. I'm gonna use words like endurance and cardiovascular and outdoors, so you might not understand it all, but pour yourself a protein shake and go with the flow. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So over the last few years, I have done a ton of OCRs and despite not being the ideal size for them, I've gone from being a bit rubbish to okay. I've done short events, completed in around half an hour and long distance ones, taking four hours and beyond. So I'm not remotely an elite runner, but I do understand very well things like turning up as a beginner, learning the skills required to do better, and more recently what it's really like to attack and race a course. And then with regards to high rocks, I've only done a couple of their events, but everyone is the same, and having podiumed in my last race, I've definitely got the hang of it. In addition, my wife Jenna has spectated at both types of events, and she's competed in her first obstacle course race last weekend, and is currently training to compete in her first high rocks in a couple of months. So I've drawn on her experience as a complete newbie for some parts of this video. Before we get stuck in, just for clarity, I've done OCRs with many different companies, but the vast majority have been with Spartans. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about will be particular to their events. Of course, there is an overlap between all types of obstacle course races, but there are some bits quite specific to how Spartan do things. And with regards to High Rocks, if you've not heard of it before, I'm gonna link up the top to a video covering my first race with them. If you don't have time to go and watch that now, in summary, it's an indoor event consisting of a one kilometer run around an arena before entering that arena to complete a fitness task, ski erg, rowing, sled push, etc and then back out for another 1K run, around and around, 8K, eight tasks. Always the same format every time the event is run, and like Spartan, takes place all over the world. So let's do this like this. Let's consider the different types of people out there and the different types of requirements that they might have for a fun day out and see which one suits them best. The complete newbie. So let's start here. If you have never done either, perhaps even a bit of a beginner to fitness in general, which one first? And the simple answer is, doesn't matter. You could turn up at an obstacle course race or a high rocks event unprepared and struggle round properly. Now I'm a big believer in the idea that you don't need to wait until you are fit to do something like this. I've seen and been inspired by many people hauling themselves around these events despite obviously not being in the best shape. But there's a limit. If, let's say you can't even jog a mile, you might find either a pretty unpleasant experience. My own suggestion would be that being able to jog non-stop, even slowly, a 5k is probably something of a minimal requirement. I'm sure there are people who can't do that that have then run these events. My point is simply that if you took 100 people that can't run 5K and stuck them into these, you could have a lot of people thinking, I'm gonna get a bit fitter before doing my next one, and four people in a coma. Oh, and I should point out that while High Rocks is always the same, eight kilometers of running, obstacle course distances can vary. So Spartan do a short, medium, and long distance, if you're able to run a 5K non-stop and that's your limit, then high rocks will be fine and a short spot and the same. But entering a Spartan beast at 20 kilometers plus, normally over pretty extreme terrain, that's not wise. So that issue aside, newbies can start with either, but I'd suggest getting a hang of jogging around the block first. In reality, most of the people that I talk to who are interested in these are already at least casual runners, maybe doing the odd 10K fun run or something. They might be an enter the half marathon, and once you're at that level, even if you're not fast, you're gonna be absolutely fine. You are fit enough to enjoy yourself at either event. It's where I began. I'd never run further than 10K when I did my first Spartan, and I was okay. I ran a bit, I walked a bit, I got round. Okay, our next individual is the scared to fail one. 
I said I talked to a lot of people about these. I get a lot of people emailing me about them too. And the most common worry is from people that are just thinking they're gonna fail at something and that puts them off going for it or causes them to train way beyond a point where they needed to, to just get to a place where they could have got an event under their belt. And that's a pity. I understand that fear of not being able to do something, of looking silly or feeling like you look silly. So while my advice is no one else cares what you look like, I do get it. But here is where there is a significant difference between the two. At a Spartan race, you're almost guaranteed to fail at something. Even elite racers will occasionally screw up. And when you're new, you might go into an event expecting to not complete a whole variety of tasks ahead of you. Jen did her first race Sunday. I think she failed five different obstacles. Now, I'm going to ignore that Spartan has an open and a competitive category, which treats failure a little differently because I'm going to come on to that later. For now, all you need to know is that you can fail a task and for beginners, it's largely expected. How you feel about that depends. Some people like the idea that they can do something like monkey bars with zero positive mental attitude, fall off the first rung and they're done with that obstacle, failed but over with. They don't need to worry about completing it because they didn't expect to complete it. Now, as somebody who did fall off the first rung of the monkey bars on my first obstacle course race, I hate that aspect. To me, a good challenge needs to be achievable. Now, I went away from that first event and trained and trained and trained until I got to a point where I was completing Spartan races without failing anything. But there are gonna be people unable to do that, not willing or able to throw themselves just completely into the rather selfish pastime of becoming proficient on monkey bars. If you're okay with that, it's great. But I don't like the idea that it's a likely scenario that a challenge in front of me won't get completed. I don't think there's a solution. Maybe you could have people allow two or three attempts at the same thing before it's deemed a fail, but that's incredibly hard to marshal and monitor. So I'm not saying Spartan should change it at all, it's just an aspect of the event that frustrates me. For example, Jen went the week before her race to the gym and trained on the rings. She tore her hands to pieces getting to a point where she felt confident, and on Sunday, she grabbed the first ring, her hands were sweaty, it took her by surprise, she fell off. That's it. Second chance, she'd have nailed it, but instead she's having to run a penalty lap. Bottom line, some failure is part of Spartan for most people. Now in contrast, high rocks, you aren't failing anything. It might take you a very long time to complete one of the tasks, but eventually you'll achieve success. Even the person that comes in with the longest time of the day would have had a multitude of non-stop successful challenges completed. If you're thinking, no, I've seen those challenges, they are tough. They are, but my mum could go to High Rocks and get round. She'd come home eventually without any sort of failure. They are tough but doable. It's a perfect challenge. So having a fear of failure should not put you off either, but the reality is actual failure to some extent is more likely an obstacle course race. Even when you get pretty good. I don't expect to fail anything at Spartan, but still have days where it just doesn't all line up. <laughs> Oh, the other thing worth mentioning at High Rocks is that you might think that because you're all in the same arena together that you might stand out as being somebody struggling if you are. Actually, it's the opposite. There are so many waves of runners competing out of sync with each other all at once. No one has a clue where any one individual is versus another person. You basically get lost amongst the crowd. At Spartan, if you're running in your age group, as you should, just like any weekend fun run, you know where you are in relation to people around you because if they're faster, they bug it off. On the plus side, you'll probably be in the middle of nowhere, so there's actually no one watching anyway. The runner. Let's say you are already a runner, and I would guess most people going into either of these events will have some running background. So if that's you, especially if your body is built for distance running and you find it comfortable to do it, go to a Spartan and crush it. Much to my annoyance, as someone six foot six and 220 pounds, obstacle course races will always get won by great runners. It's the vast majority of the event. On top of that, many of the obstacles lend themselves to people with a good runner's build, a good strength to weight ratio. And although your typical runner might not look classically strong, they are typically lighter in weight, so that ratio is good. It's why kids in the park can hang on monkey bars all day long. They don't weigh very much. I'm not saying, some of the classic runner's build is exactly the same strength as a child. I'm just saying they're approximately the same strength as a child. So Mr. or Mrs. Runner, you're gonna have a lot of fun at a Spartan. You will fly across the body weight exercises and you will race across the course. The only time that you might encounter a problem is on the very few tasks where larger body weight helps. At the stone carry, hoist, plate drag maybe, but that's three events lasting minutes. It just won't matter. I've got into those challenges done them in seconds and left the lightweight runners still struggling. I've run on, proud of myself, chuckling at their childlike strength, 
and then a kilometer later, they come past me and vanish, leaving me trying to lug myself up a hill. You just can't muscle your way around a Spartan race and do well. That is not to say that High Rocks does not rely on you being a good runner too. Running is still the majority of what you're going to be doing there as well. But in very simple terms, a classic runner will spend the vast majority of a Spartan in their element and a reasonably significant amount of time at a High Rocks wondering if they should dig out those dumbbells from the attic when they get home. So let's flip it, the gym bro. Now I get less emails from people whose only form of exercise is lifting weights. They just don't seem to watch my videos in huge numbers. But pour yourself a protein shake and go with the flow. I've no idea why. But let's say that is you and you're contemplating a break from the mirror to try something new. Or maybe you're into CrossFit and you fancy a day off from all that kipping. Will you, a bigger person, somebody with more experience in the gym than out on the trail, will you have more fun at High Rocks? Yes, probably. You're still going to cover 8K, but it's done at 1K intervals, and you're going to find a greater percentage of High Rocks tasks will favor your size or your gym experience, or both. For example, because of my size, the skier, the sled push, the sled pull, the row, the farmer's carry, all those suit me far better than someone smaller and lighter, somebody with a traditional runner's build. That's five out of the eight tasks. Is that enough to see you on top of the podium? No. High Rocks is still going to be won by somebody that runs fast. At my last one, for example, I was quick on the strength-based tasks, and despite having a 90-minute 5K, which is not slow, I was still beating the first place in my age group by a guy that could literally run rings around me. But that aside, the sense of achievement, the sense of really excelling at a decent amount of the event is much greater for me at High Rock. So I can come away thinking, irrespective of the event as a whole, I'm really happy with how I did that bit and that bit. Now before the next one, if you have any interest in the actual events that I'm doing, jump onto my website, marklewis.co.uk, and there is a whole section on there showing you what I have coming up, including OCR and High Rocks races, along with all sorts of other stuff, the gear I use, the nutrition I take, it's all there. And that is a transition as silky smooth as my spear throw <sighs> into this video sponsor, Squarespace, who I use to create my website. And it's companies like that whose service or products I use and I'm happy to recommend that help keep this channel going. So for an example of what somebody with no idea what they're doing can do with Squarespace, go check out my site. It covers so many of the questions that I get asked all the time about the equipment I'm using, the events I'm in, and obviously links to all those things too. And because it's so easy to edit and update, we are constantly adding new stuff there. For example, the ski erg that I just bought recently for the garage is now on the site. And it's not just gear and events, there's stuff on there describing things I use for supplementing my diet, recovery. There's even a section on there showing the stuff I use to film these videos. And links to my Instagram, Facebook, Patreon channel, all that sort of stuff. So very happy to recommend them. If you're interested in getting your own site, simply go to Squarespace, pick a template, edit it to look the way you want and make it as fancy as you like. And I should add, like much of the stuff I use, I've only scratched the surface of what it can actually do. So don't use my site as a guide to the limits of what you can create. There is plenty more I could have done how I wanted to, and indeed I might get round to doing, including stuff like setting up and maintaining my own blog. And if you have e-commerce requirements, they can handle that for you and even deal with any of your more general domain needs. So if you need a website for your business or even just for fun to share stuff with friends and family and you want one that is so easy to use that me getting Jenna to set up for me was mostly down to my laziness and not a reflection of actually how complicated it is, go to squarespace.com. They'll give you a free trial and when you're ready to launch your own site, use the code Mark Lewis for 10% off. Okay, back to it and who is next? It's the competitive bod. So what if you're super competitive? And very important, this has no relationship to ability. I am super competitive. When I started doing OCR, I was super rubbish, but I still wanted to compete. For that reason, my first Spartan race and every race since has been in the age group category. Jen's race this weekend, straight into age group. Her first Spartan ever, a few months ago, struggling to get around a park run in under half an hour, she went into age group. So let me explain first what age group is and why I think everybody should at least consider running in it. At Spartan, there are three categories of racer, open, age group, elite. Ignore elite, they're elite. Age group and open has nothing to do with ability. In age group, you race against other people your age and you do so by the rules. The same rules being followed by those running elite. That might sound obvious, it's called Spartan race. That sounds like a competition, so therefore surely it has some rules. However, more people will race in the open category. Now Spartan will still give you a time if you do that, you can compare it against others, but it's a little bit meaningless. There's no enforcement of the penalties in open waves, people are helping each other, 
It's effectively a fun run, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. If you want to just go along and just enjoy your day out with no concern about how long it takes you to do it, off you go. But if you want to go home feeling like you competed on a level playing field and with accurate results showing where you came, age group. Do not think it is a category only for excellent athletes. It's a category for anybody wanting to compete. Where you come in that race, who knows? Maybe last, like me on my first go. But you go home with your red headband, proud that you put yourself into that environment to be tested. At the weekend when I finished my race, I doubled back on the course to wait for Jen. The age group women were running 15 minutes behind the age group older men. And I stood in the clearing in the woods and I waited. And one after another, age group women were coming past me. She's nowhere to be seen. And then just as I'm thinking there can't be any more age group women to come, she emerges coming down the trail, miles behind the leaders, doesn't matter. She runs out of the woods, a competitive athlete, testing herself properly. As it turns out, she wasn't last in her age group. In fact, she actually had a better result than my first Spartan. But that's neither here nor there. She was racing. And aside from elite, age group is the only category to do that in. So let's compare age group Spartan against high rocks for someone competitive. On the surface, both are great. If you're pretty good, you have a chance of podium for your age group, but prize for doing so, it's all great. And if you're really good, you could step up in Spartan to Elite or in High Rocks, you could race in the Pro Division. But where High Rocks has the advantage for everyone is in allowing anybody to find a success in their performance, even if your overall race did not go the way you'd hoped. One of the things I would always get frustrated at with Spartan was that I'd often finish somewhere in the middle of my age group, 10th out of 20 or something, which is fine. But I always wished there was some acknowledgement of the bits I was doing well at. I knew I was probably completing things like the hoist or the atlas carry faster than most people in any age group, but it meant nothing. No one even knew I'd done it that fast. They, they did know because I told everyone I could, but it wasn't written down anywhere. So the most amazing thing about High Rocks for me was when after I'd completed my first event, I was able to download my results in detail. They have an electronic chip timer on you and everywhere you go, you have been monitored. So your ankle chip can see how long it took you to go from one obstacle to another, how fast your individual runs were, even how long it takes you to get from finishing the run to starting the next obstacle. And so on that first race, even though my overall time was fairly average, I was able to find little successes within it. I was the fastest on a couple of challenges, I was second or third fastest on a couple of others. It meant I had a real sense of achievement that was greater than perhaps appropriate for my overall result. But the nice thing is that there would have been somebody else, maybe rubbish on the challenges, but an amazing runner doing the same thing but in relation to their run times. So you end up with a large number of people spread across a large number of finishing places but all able to see something they did well at. That's incredibly motivating and provides a huge sense of satisfaction. Quite simply, if you like to do well, you like to see how well you're doing, High Rocks will give you the opportunity to find that information. And if you're thinking, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm just rubbish at everything, I guarantee you, if that's your actual situation right now, you'll find a small victory in one area of High Rocks long before you stand on a podium anywhere. And the minute you do two High Rocks events, you're sorted because you can then look at two sets of data side by side and you will find something positive. Now you can argue that you have a similar situation in OCR because you might think, well, I only failed three obstacles this time and it was five obstacles last time. But is that because you were better or was it wet last time and everything was slippy? No two obstacle course race courses are the same anyway. But at High Rocks, if you did a four and a half minute row last time and a four minute 15 this time, you are getting better. For me, it's a highlight of the event to pour over that information. And as I'll talk about in a bit, it's also a brilliant way to work out what you need to focus your training on. The spectator. Okay, let's bounce over to spectating. If you have devoted so much of your life to training that everyone important to you has long since left you, sad and lonely, this won't really matter. But if you still have people hanging around and hope that one day you'll prioritize them over your Garmin stats, the spectating experience might be important. And here, High Rocks destroys any OCR that I've ever done. And that isn't really the event's fault. It's just that most obstacle course races take place over such a large area. For example, that race that Jenna did, just the weekend gone, as I said, as soon as I finished, I grabbed my medal and I doubled back on myself so I could watch her finish. But logistically, I can only go back about two or three obstacles before going any further would involve me just running kilometers up into the woods. Had I been an actual spectator with nothing to do other than wait for her, I'd have seen her set off at the beginning and then a couple of hours later I'd seen her do the last 15 minutes. 
it's simply not a great spectator sport. Some events have been laid out better where they'll zigzag the final obstacles backwards and forwards so that people watching do get a better sense of what's going on, but just as many are the opposite. I've had Jenna waiting hours, literally hours, for me to finish a Spartan Beast race where she'd have seen me set off in the morning in the dark and then when I emerged from the forest 30 seconds before the finish line. Now most events have some sort of race village where there might be some snacks to buy and some music playing to entertain you, but to be honest, for me, a coffee and a wedding DJ, glad of a daytime gig, that wouldn't entertain me for hours if I had nothing else to do but wait for my other half. However, High Rocks is all indoors, it's all in the same place. Most events take place in big exhibition centres, so there's already restaurants and cafes and toilets and so on there. The toilets that, unlike the ones at Spartan this weekend, aren't disgusting. And of course, the racing itself is something your spectator can get right up close to. Yes, come on! Out, get out, get out, get out! And run, run out, run out, run! You need to jump around the arena a bit to find the different stations that the person you're watching will be competing at, but that's no big deal. It's quite possible to watch at least 90% of what they're doing and be feet away from them. And not only does that make for a completely different atmosphere for the pure racing and a much more exciting experience for the spectator, I'd imagine an awful lot of those people watching then decide to enter a future race having seen how much fun it is. In fact, that's exactly what Jenna did. She filmed me a couple of times at High Rocks, now we'll be racing. The Prepper. This is not the person who lives in his parents' shed surrounded by tins of beans and toilet paper waiting for Judgment Day. This is the person who comes away from an event determined to work on their shortcomings so they're better prepared next time. So after my first Spartan, I went online, I joined all the Facebook obstacle course groups I could find, I asked how to get better, and the advice I got, which is advice I give, was run, and then run, and then go do some running. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, there's a lot of running involved. If I'm racing a 100k ultramarathon later this year, and once I recover from having done it, if I was to jump straight into a Spartan race, with that recent training history of doing nothing but running and getting lighter, I'd be a better Spartan, guaranteed. But the other reason, is it's just not quite as simple to train for the obstacles in a Spartan race as it is the challenges in the high rocks. So you naturally gravitate to running, which you can do easily. Now, if you're lucky enough to live near somewhere that does have the facilities, you're good to go. But places like that with rope climbs and rings and walls to climb, they're just not as abundant as a regular gym that will probably have most of what you need for high rocks. And in addition, training for high rocks has a huge overlap to regular functional fitness training that you might be doing anyway. Rowing, ski erg, lunges, burpees, they're pretty standard things to be doing in a gym whether you compete at high rocks or not. And the things that are a bit more specific, pushing and pulling a sled, wall balls, if you've got a gym like mine that's pretty poorly equipped, it's still very easy to substitute in a different exercise that will mimic those. And going back to the data provided after a high rocks event, if you want to give that information to a coach or even work it out yourself, it's pretty straightforward to construct a great training program that will specifically sort out any weaknesses you've got, but still be great for your overall health and fitness. It's literally what I do. I send my High Rocks results to my coach, Dave Peters. He supplies me with a program so that I'm ready for my next event. But I'll have told him that between those two, I also want to be doing maybe a 10K, maybe a Spartan, that ultra marathon, and it's easy enough for him to tweak things so that all that can happen as well. I end up with a program that is really diverse, a mix of lifting and running and functional fitness, high intensity cardio, long steady state cardio. If High Rocks disappeared tomorrow, I'd keep training in a similar way forever. If Spartan disappeared tomorrow, I'd probably stop going as much to the kids park and hanging shirtless off the swings while the concerned parents usher their traumatized offspring away. Okay, last one, the collector. If you'd like to go home from an event with a memento, some hardware, Spartan have you covered. You're gonna get a medal that looks like it's come out of Lord of the Rings. You're gonna get a t-shirt with the type of event you just ran on it. If that's not enough, if you run three different types of events with them in a year, you get a trifecta medal. If you do all three events in one weekend, you get another medal. I've lost track of what is back there. And that's just a couple of years worth. It's the COVID era. In fact, it's up there to remind myself how hard it was during that time to get out and focus on your health and fitness. In contrast, if you run High Rocks, you get a fabric badge, the like of which I've not seen since I got one for swimming five meters in 1979 and had my mum sew onto my trunks. And if you make it to a podium, you still aren't getting anything close to a medal at a regular High Rocks event. You basically get a tea towel. How you feel about that might depend on what you have already done. I only really started doing events that had medals in 2019, but in just those few years, I've already got more of those things I know what to do with. I can vividly remember the excitement of getting them early on and how important they were to me, so I get it, 
But like anything you have a lot of that's not a donut, the appeal lessens after a while. So when I got my Hyrox badge, after the initial surprise, it wasn't a medal, but then the pleasant realization that it was Velcro backed, so it could actually go on my bag. I didn't need to ask my mum to get her sewing kit out. I was pretty happy with it. If it saves them money and they can invest that into the event elsewhere, good stuff. But if you're new to events like this, I can understand that you might feel a bit shortchanged when even your local 10K fun run will give you something to hang around your neck. So while I would say in defense of High Rocks, you might not take home any bling, but the photos they produce for you are a far better way to hold on to memories of the event anyway. A recurring complaint at UK Spartan races is the photographs, although free, are a bit boring. Their photographers normally set themselves up at the finish line or an obstacle where they just know you're gonna be going slow and so they're easy to snap. As such, I've got loads of photographs of me carrying a bucket or jumping over a log. I don't even bother looking for my photos online after the event now. Meanwhile, High Rocks, they do charge for the photos, but to be fair, they are worth it. Their photographers are running all over the course, shoving cameras in your face. They are like sweaty paparazzi. As a result, you end up with some pretty cool pictures. And of course, if you're taking a spectator along, they'll probably be able to get some good photographs or maybe some video of you as well. So much as I enjoy a medal, I value a great picture as a personal reminder of what I did more highly. Okay, that is it, almost, except to say this. I currently have a slight preference for High Rocks. It's new, it's exciting. And I'm aware that might come out in my comparison of the events. So I just wanted to add this for balance. Something Spartan has the ability to do, and it reminded me this weekend, that High Rocks just can't compete with, is making you feel like you are on your way to hunt down dinner or run from tigers. There is just something primal about swinging across an obstacle, hitting the bell, dropping to the floor, and disappearing into the forest. I don't remotely have a runner's build, but when I am charging through the woods, trying to catch the person in the distance or stay ahead of the person behind me, or just fighting with myself to not slow down to a walk, it just feels like my body is being asked to do exactly what it is supposed to be able to do. It has nothing to do with my ability. It is simply being outdoors at your limit, moving forwards. I love it. Racing at Spartan was literally the first fitness content I put on this channel three years ago. If it wasn't for Spartan, I would not be here now doing this. Okay, I'm out of here. Spear throw will not practice itself. <laughs> oh, fuck.